Hi again, everyone. If you are just joining us, we are going to get started in a couple of minutes. Take your time to get settled and we'll start in a little bit. How do we feel? Are we ready to start? Um, do you want to give it another minute? Maybe one more minute. OK. Great. We may want to also mention that this session will be recorded, and so we will have it, in we will have it available for all of our guests. Good. Ready to go? All right. Great. Well, welcome again, everyone. If you're just joining us, um, we have a really exciting program for you this morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you might be joining us from. Um, although I think we're talking afternoon and evening at this point for this group. But welcome. My name is Mackie Siebens. I'm the director of admission at Bard College. We're going to go through and do some introductions so you know who all the panelists are and the colleges that are gonna be represented. Um, and before we do that, I'm just gonna walk you through um, the agenda. Uh, so if you wanna to go to the next slide, we can take a little quick sneak peek at what you can expect from the session this evening. So um, the agenda lists here uh, seven main points. As I said, we're gonna move into introductions and talk a little bit about who we are. We are gathered together as seven institutions, um, very rigorous programs, liberal arts and sciences college, uh, colleges are, are sort of all, represent all of us, um, are good descriptions for things that we do. Um, we really do have a wide range of liberal arts and sciences programs, focus on the undergraduate, um, and really look to support students through a liberal arts and sciences program and go out into the world, whether that's graduate school or um, jobs. Um, and hope, hopefully they are really, really secure in who they are, in their skill set, um, and feel really prepared to enter um, the working world coming through our program. So um, we're really excited to host you and uh, we will get to introductions so you can learn um, a little bit about all of us shortly. Um, we're going to go into what colleges are looking for. So we're going to talk a little bit about the components of an application and also how we interpret those components. Um, we're going to go into some of the hottest topics that are a buzz right now. So things like um, testing. And we're also going to talk a little bit about uh, applying in uh, a pandemic. We still are um, sort of working through the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, it's changing daily. We are pivoting daily to think about um, not only the safety of the students on our campuses and the campus community, but also the neighboring communities around us, um, global public health, um, and certainly trying to tie some of these things into our um, syllabi as well. So that's something that we, we really take seriously. So we'll talk a little bit about applying to college in this very sort of special moment, particular moment. Uh, we're also going to do some myth, bu myth busting this evening. Um, so we're going to take you through a couple of things that we hear through the grapevine rumors that go around about um, some of the things that are uh, weighted highly in the admission process when really they might not be. Um, so we're going to talk to you a little bit about that and hopefully give you some guidance um, around how to put together a strong application, how to put your best foot forward. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about what happens after you apply, what that process looks like. Um, and then we're going to um, open it up to questions. And if you have specific questions, feel free to ask at that time. We're happy to address uh, programs. We're happy to address social life, campus life, residence life. Um, all of those things. And if you want to get specific, um, that's no problem. We're here and happy to answer all of your questions. So 
uh, we're going to move on to the next slide, um, which again talks a little bit about who we are as um, liberal arts and sciences colleges. You can see all of us listed there. So as I mentioned, I'm representing Bard College. Um, we have Bennington, Denison, Pitzer, Reed, St. John's, and Whitman represented. So um, I'm going to hand it over to Bennington. We'll introduce ourselves in that order um, and circle back to Bard, and then I'll hand it over to um, my colleague who will handle the next slide. So we'll start with Bennington. Welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Tony Cabasco and I serve as Vice President for Roman here at Bennington. Welcome from Vermont. I think Denison's next. Do I think we say just two or three minutes about our colleges? Oh, sorry. Okay. No worries. <laughs> sure. Yes. Okay. Um, so, well, uh, a few words about Bennington then. Um, uh, Bennington has been breaking the mold uh, of a traditional of our college uh, from the beginning and retains that spirit in its DNA today. We're located in Vermont. Uh, we offer progressive education with an emphasis on self-directed learning and, and hands-on experience in the field. Today, Bennington is made up of 700 quirky, creative, independent undergraduate students who come from 40 states and 60 countries. Benton's network of alumni are admired as change makers, groundbreakers, and culture shapers. Alumni have won Emmys, the MacArthur Fellow, Genius Grants, and Pulitzer Prizes. We break the mold and go beyond the majors. We call it the plan process at Bennington. It, our self-directed model starts with the student's inquiry that is guided by faculty in a collaborative uh, process. You design your area of study and your advanced work at Bennington. Students may decide to combine the study of astrophysics and dance or psychology and architecture or diversity inclusion and drama. It's an innovative and flexible curriculum. There's no core curriculum, no required courses and 50% of the courses change from term to term. Narrative evaluation is a default and you, but you can ask for grades uh, if, if you would like. Uh, Bennington was the first liberal arts college institution to integrate classroom study with an annual field experience. So it's you're guaranteed to have at least four internship experiences here. It could take the form of an internship, work, volunteer, or a research experience. Um, you know, it could be interning at Google or uh, interning with uh, Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders, or maybe at an architectural firm in Italy. It could be a partnership like Museum Fellows Term Program. It's a five month study away program coursework plus internships at a major museum in New York City. So these experiences prepare you for life after Bennington. And we find that our alumni are well prepared for jobs and careers uh, as a result. So if you're interested in, in a college that places you and gives you agency in your education and provides you some interesting uh, field work experiences, I hope you consider Bennington. Awesome, thank you, Tony. Um, hi everyone, my name is Drew Riley, Director of Admission at Denison University. Uh, Denison University is located in Granville, Ohio. Um, we're a community of about 2,300 undergraduate students. Our students study across 56 academic programs um, and uh, we are a fully residential campus. Um, so students live on campus for all four years at Denison. Um, for those of you who have not been to beautiful Granville, Ohio, it's a gorgeous New England style village set in the Welsh Hills in central Ohio and uh, the epitome of a college town. You know, cute downtown, great restaurants, shops, et cetera. Um, Denison sits on a hill right above the village of Granville. Um, the leaves are changing right now, so it's a particularly good time to visit, I must say. Um, we are also located about 20 miles east of Columbus, Ohio. So Columbus, as the state capital of Ohio, is also the largest metropolitan area in the state of Ohio and the 14th largest city in the country. Um, the metropolitan area is made up of about um, 2.6 million people in the Columbus area. Um, one of the largest state capitals in the country, home to the headquarters of about 17 Fortune 500 companies um, and a major scene um, in the Midwest for arts and athletics and um, great food um, and a huge variety of opportunities. And so um, for our students, they're provided the opportunity to have that small college town experience, um, but adjacent to a major metropolitan area and all of the opportunities that adds for them um, culturally, for fun, um, as well as professionally. Um, and speaking of professionally, that's a big emphasis of ours at Denison. So we're a traditional liberal arts college in most ways, um, but there's a major emphasis at Denison on preparing students to think deeply about um, and really deeply prepare for their lives post-graduation. 
Um, so we have a phenomenal career center, the Knowlton Center for Career Exploration, um, that is home to 16 full-time college counselors, internship coordinate, coordinators, um, grad school counselors. Um, we have something called the Red Frame Lab for students who are interested in entrepreneurship, design thinking, and consulting. Um, and recently we opened a, a new facility, a part of a wing of our um, career Exploration Center called the Denison Edge Program um, that is located in downtown Columbus um, on the edge of the Arena District and it's focused on skill building, so professional skill building for students to bolster their resumes and help them prepare um, for that step post-graduation. Um, in terms of our curriculum, we offer, like I said, 56 major programs um, from the humanities to social sciences, natural sciences, um, and great arts programs as well. Um, some of our most popular majors on campus include economics, psychology, um, global commerce, data analytics, um, English, politics and public affairs, um, among a variety of other programs. Um, and the last thing I want to leave you with is, you know, one thing that we are very intentional about and very proud of at Denison is the deep relationships that our students build um, with their faculty members. Um, you know, the stat that we love to cite is that 92% of Denison students um, find a mentor among the faculty during their four years of their undergraduate experience. And that's, we're very intentional about that. Um, that's tied very closely to future success, to grad school admission rates and future earnings and a whole lot of things. If students are able to find a mentor among the faculty um, during their four years um, of, of undergraduate college experience. So we create a lot of spaces for that and we're very intentional about making sure that our faculty are here to build those very close relationships inside and out of the class and outside of the classroom um, with our students. Um, so that's a little bit about Denison. Thank you for being here again tonight. I'm happy to chat with you and I will pass it on to my colleague from Pittsburgh. Hello everyone. My name is Yvonne Berman. I'm the Vice President and Dean of Admission at Pittsburgh. And um, I'm welcoming you actually from sunny California. Um, on this beautiful day, we actually have about, it's about 90 degrees, believe it or not, um, so close to November. Um, but Pitzer is actually located in Claremont, again, Claremont, California. We are a member of the Claremont Colleges, so I'd be remiss to not mention my sister schools, Pomona, Claremont McKenna, Scripps, and Harvey Mudd. Um, Pitzer is, is the smallest of the five schools, um, or one of the smallest, it's about 1,200 students. Now, I think one of the things that really separates um, Pitzer is that we were founded in 1963. So um, part of, I think, what makes us a little unique is that, again, similar to my colleagues, a very progressive style of education, um, we actually don't have much of a core curriculum. We allow students to um, create their own majors or major off campus or major in any one of our 40 different majors on campus. I think also what separates us as well is that we have a core, um, I'm sorry, we have core values that are basically central to the academic and social life of every student. So our core values include um, inter interdisciplinary learning, which is pretty typical given the fact that we're a liberal arts college, um, social responsibility, which again ties back to the 1963 founding, intercultural understanding, um, student engagement, which again goes back to again that founding, and environmental sustainability. So regardless of whether these are part of what you're looking for in college or just something that you happen upon, it is something that you're going to um, embark on once you're a student on our campus. Um, in addition to that, we do find that because of that 1963 founding, we also sponsor a shared governance process, which means that our students have equal voting power on our campus. And that also makes us a little unique. In many places you hear we really want the student voice but rarely do you see that students actually have equal voting power. Um, to give you an idea, last year, Pitzer was closed like many schools in California due to the pandemic. And so we established a COVID task force. We actually had students that were part of the task force that were helping to decide whether the college would open, how it would open, and how we would pro provide a safe and healthy environment for our students once they arrive. So again, it's an opportunity for students that have been engaged, that have been activists, that may have been leaders, at their high school to be able to join a campus in which their voice is also very much appreciated. And the same thing even goes with our social responsibility component. Um, whether, it doesn't matter what major you're in, every student must fulfill some type of a social responsibility thesis, um, I'm sorry, theory and praxis course, which basically allows students to understand how you begin to make social action happen. I think after this pandemic, I think a lot of students are really looking to how to change the world Pitzer is a really great place to do that. So as I mentioned, Pitzer is a little unique in the sense that 
We are from California. We do provide that liberal arts education that you typically find on more of the East Coast. But at the same time, we have these wonderful sister schools that also allow you to expand your options. So even though you're in a school of about 1,200 students, because of the Claremont and the benefits of the Claremont Consortium, we're basically able to offer every student about 2,000 courses every semester. So between that and social activities and different eateries and different um, uh, speakers that may be coming to the Claremont Consortium, you basically are entering into a medium-sized university while maintaining a small class size. So that is a little bit, of, a little bit about Pitzer. I will turn it over to my next colleague. Great, thank you, Yvonne. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Milian Trulove. I'm the Vice President and Dean of Admission and Financial Aid at Reed College. Uh, just a side note, I see that you do have some questions coming in on our Q&A function. Um, after our presentation, uh, we're gonna take some time and address some of your questions. Um, some of those we'll answer in real time. And you'll see our responses for the entire group, but please go ahead and, and fill those questions up and hopefully we'll be able to address those in the presentation or at, or at, or at the very end. Um, a little bit about Reed College. Uh, Reed College is in Portland, Oregon. Um, we are a campus of about uh, 1,500 students and we're in Portland proper. We're, so we're right in Portland within city limits, about 15 minutes from downtown. Uh, we're about an hour and a half uh, from the coast. We're an hour and a half from Mount Hood. Um, and so students uh, can not only take advantage of life here in Portland, uh, which is on average one of the youngest cities uh, in the nation, uh, but they can also do things like hiking, uh, visiting the beach and, and really enjoying town with their friends. Um, the makeup of our students is interesting. Students travel further to come to Reed than any other college. Um, about 8% are from Oregon, but our students hail from all over the country. So if you're coming from New York, uh, from Florida, from Illinois, you won't be alone. You're gonna meet many students who are from your state. And I think it makes for a really interesting atmosphere in addition to that, you'll have about 10 to 15% of the students who are um, uh, international students. It's a culturally diverse campus where about a third of our domestic students are students of color. Um, it's a place where you'll meet with people from all different walks of life. Um, I usually tell students, if, if you're someone who um, has been in a class and heard your teacher say something and you connected that to something that you heard in a different class and you can't stop thinking about it, as such, you find yourself back in that class talking to that teacher saying, I, I, I got to hear more about this. Tell me more about this idea. How does this connect? If that sounds like you, you might be a really good fit for Reed. Um, if you're if you're curious, if you like talking about what you learned outside of the classroom um, to your teachers, to other members of your community, to the students, um, Reed might be a really good place for you. Um, some people use the word um, uh, really, really unique students who are looking at Reed. I think there are plenty of really traditional students who are looking at Reed too, and it's a place where all people can really live the life of the mind. Uh, in addition to that, um, the way that you learn is really intimate. Um, we call our professors by their first name. So you see on my name, it says Milian. People call me Milian. You call your professor by their first name. That's because they're your academic colleagues. You have experiences like a paper conference, an hour where you sit down with your professor and you talk about your paper, and that's all you talk about. And in that experience, the professor asks you about ideas you mentioned in class, but didn't come out in that paper. What did you mean on this particular section? They might want more of that. You walk away from this experience more excited to go at that paper than when you first started. And that's a snapshot of the read experience. You're, you're talking about learning. You're not focusing on the grades. You, you get grades, but you don't automatically receive those because the emphasis is on the learning. Sounds really challenging when you're a first year student. By the time you're a senior, you can't think of it any other way. And your grasp of the information is, is exceptional. In fact, um, Reed ranks among the top five schools for PhD product, production per capita. If you do well at Reed, you will do well anywhere. Um, and so we're a college that's excited to meet you. Uh, we're all for virtual visits. We offer in-person in visits. We're a school that was hybrid last year, in-person this year. Uh, so come and um, find out more uh, in more detail um, at some time in the future. And I'm going to pass this on uh, to my colleague. I think, Adam, you're up. I think it's Ben, right? I Alphabetically, it's me. So oh, I'll sorry, Ben. <laughs> I did it again. <laughs> no problem. And then I'll give it to Adam. <laughs> okay. 
This is um, Ben Baum, I'm Vice President of Enrollment at St. John's College, um, which is actually the third oldest college in the United States. St. John's was founded in 1696 in Annapolis, Maryland, which is this small um, colonial town right outside of Washington, D.C. on the water. Um, and so we've been around for 325 years. In 1964, we actually founded a second campus with another 500 students on that campus in Santa Fe, New Mexico, on the other side of the country, in the mountains, a very different environment. But St. John's actually isn't particularly famous for how old we are or where our two campuses are located. What makes us famous is our extraordinarily unusual curriculum. Um, we call it a great books curriculum. And, um, and what we do is, um, is something that you don't find much elsewhere in higher education. We don't have majors at St. John's. We don't have lectures. We don't use textbooks. Instead, we read the original works by some of the greatest writers of all time, going back about 3,000 years. We start in the ancient world with Homer and Plato and Aristotle, and we read our way into the modern world through Dante and Shakespeare and Jane Austen and Virginia Woolf and Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln um, until we arrive at people like Albert Einstein and James Baldwin. And, um, and through reading these original authors, we study about two dozen different subjects. Instead of majors, we major in um, just about everything. Uh, we read philosophy, we read history, literature, we read books in math and science, in language and music. And when we come to class after reading these books, uh, every single class at St. John's is a discussion with 20 students or fewer talking about these really big ideas. And, um, and what draws people to St. John's can on one hand be how excited they are for these books. Um, on the other hand, it might be the discussion itself to be in a classroom where students are genuinely excited to be talking about ideas and where our student to faculty ratio is seven to one. And so you have this really intimate experience, not only with your peers, but also with the faculty. Uh, this experience, I think a lot of students find transformational. We tend to draw students who are looking to understand themselves in the world. Um, they have a real intellectual bent. We're the kind of place where you're talking about you know, Homer's Iliad in class, and then you go into the dorms and you go into the dining hall and you're still talking about Homer's Iliad. Uh, and so as a result, um, we send students to, um, to out into the world to really every different profession you can imagine, but there's a definite spin. Our students tend to become um, teachers, they tend to become professors, they become journalists, they become lawyers. Uh, we send the vast majority of our students on to graduate school. Uh, I'd love to talk more about St. John's and answer your questions as we go ahead, but um, I'll pause there and I will hand it over to Adam at Whitman next. Thanks, Ben. Uh, great to see you all. Thanks for joining us this evening. Um, really excited to tell you about Whitman. Uh, we are a school of about 1,500 students uh, located here in the incredibly scenic Walla Walla Valley, nestled at the foothills of the Blue Mountains. Uh, in the eastern part of Washington state, where it's a little bit warmer and uh, drier than the rest of the Northwest. Um, our campus is stunningly beautiful. It's full of public art, creeks and ponds, and award-winning trees. We're actually very, very proud of our trees. We have a one-to-one -one student to tree ratio. So if you come to Whitman, you're gonna get to at least have your own tree to sit under while you're uh, studying. Um, it is a challenging curriculum for sure. Uh, we are a place that uh, believes that our job is to challenging, challenge you so that you will have a transformational educational journey. Um, and part of doing that is also offering really wonderful support. So I think we, we uh, do an amazing job of kind of providing that kind of individual mentorship and support um, with uh, an extremely challenging curriculum. Uh, we have more than 50 majors uh, available for you to choose from, as well as concentrations and minors that you can use to really individualize uh, your academic journey. Um, some of our really popular programs, we actually have uh, more than 10 uh, programs related to environmental studies. Um, so if you're interested in the environment, this is a fantastic place to um, kind of delve into that and then uh, put your own spin on it um, through those uh, uh, you know, 10 plus um, different majors that we have in that area. Uh, we have really wonderful programs throughout the arts and the humanities. Um, a lot of uh, our students study in music and theater um, as, in addition to other majors that they might have. Um, on the sciences side, uh, our most popular major is probably BBMB, which is a mouthful. It's biochemistry, biophysics, and molecular biology. Um, one of the, the programs that really produces some of um, the, the leading kind of scientists and researchers uh, 
uh, around the country. Um, and we also have new programs in computer science and data science that ha have grown really uh, popular and that we're uh, hiring more faculty for every year to meet the increased demand. Um, so really wonderful academic program across the board. Um, in terms of the students that we attract, um, Whitman is, is kind of fortunate that um, we are in a situation where most of our students come from pretty far away. Uh, about 90% of this year's incoming class grew up more than 200 miles away from uh, where Walla Walla is. And so if you're thinking, gosh, I've never been to Walla Walla, it seems like it's kind of far away, you'll be in good company. Um, you'll be in a, a residence hall full of folks that are far from home and um, that will really bond around that kind of notion of going away to college and being together. Uh, about 10 to 12% of our students are international students. We have wonderful financial aid programs for our international students um, and our domestic students come from almost every state across the country. Um, the Whitman experience is really characterized by getting out and being active in the community. Um, our students really care about making a difference locally, um, and that happens through um, everything from community service to political activism. Um, I actually love the ways that um, the students that I've recruited are now in the lives of my, my daughters. I have a five-year-old and a seven-year-old in the local public schools, and Whitman does this amazing program called Whitman Teaches the Movement, where our students volunteer in the local uh, elementary schools teaching about the civil rights movement. Um, it's really cool that my daughter gets to come home and be excited about learning things that she'd never heard before from Whitman students. Um, and that hands-on experience is really a big piece of the Whitman journey. Um, we have uh, wonderful study abroad programs, of course. Um, we also have a really unique off-campus study experience called Semester in the West, where students get to spend an entire semester exploring the Western United States, um, traveling together. Um, it, getting to see the beauty of the West, but also in examining issues of regional significance, uh, water policy, forest fires, immigration, um, in a really comprehensive way. Um, so Semester in the West is definitely an exciting program to check out. Um, last thing I want to land on is that uh, we know that cost and affordability matters. And a couple of years ago, Whitman started doing something called an early financial aid guarantee, where you can actually find out your full financial aid package before you've even ap applied. So to whatever extent a cost might be on your mind, that's a great program to actually see a comprehensive financial aid package um, uh, without having to make any sort of commitment uh, to Whitman or even uh, filling out a complete application for admission. So i um, love to tell you all more about Whitman uh, through the, uh, the questions that you might have. And I believe we're moving on to talking about application components. Is that right? Um, I'm going to jump in first and just circle back to Bard, and then I'll hand it back to you, Adam. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. Um, me again, Mackie Siebens, Director of Admission at Bard College. Um, and uh, Bard is a small liberal arts and sciences college. Uh, we're in good company here. Um, and our oldest and largest campus is in the Hudson Valley in New York, about two hours north of Manhattan, right on the Hudson River with um, a beautiful view of the Catskill Mountains to the west, um, serving about 1,800, just over 1,800 undergraduate students working in small discussion-based classes across uh, five main divisions, including the sciences, social studies, arts, language, literature, inter interdivisional programs. Um, but there are 6,000 Bard students worldwide, and that's because we operate uh, in a bit of an unusual model. Um, we have a much broader Bard network um, that includes international partners that we've built and campuses that we run and operate. Um, our sister campus is Bard College Berlin in Berlin, Germany. And we have partnerships in Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan, one in Vienna, Austria with Central European University. Um, and then we have the only Palestinian American collaboration in education with our partner in the West Bank, uh, Al-Quds University. So these pieces of the Bard network that fall outside um, the US um, are uh, certainly um, pieces that influence study abroad opportunities, but the college has been um, adapting education for online use over the last six or seven years um, to really foster global conversations across time zones in the classroom. So uh, debates and small size classes take place um, virtually for some students who take our network courses and want to connect with Bardians um, outside the Annandale and Hudson campus where um, I'm joining you from. Um, this broader network also includes some programs inside the US that I want to touch on very quickly. Um, we run one of the largest prison education programs in the United States, started by Bard students in the late 90s, and one of those co-founders still runs the program today from Annandale on Hudson. Um, so there are just over 300 um, incarcerated men and women getting their associates or bachelor's degree taught by Bard College faculty who commute to those uh, six medium and maximum security prisons in uh, upstate New York. Um, and we also run eight public high schools uh, across cities in the United States 
working to strengthen public school education. So uh, the, the college and this network certainly works to increase access to education and support populations who have not been able to approach uh, strong educational programs or had access to a liberal arts and sciences program specifically. Um, and this is sort of reflected in the fact that Bard was the first institution to have a human rights major. And a lot of our mission stems from that. Um, we have huge interest in human rights issues um, and uh, that's encouraged the college over the years to sort of act in the humanitarian agency space as well as the higher ed space. Um, and that's also influenced by students um, who have built, as I said, many of these programs and directed, um, directed the college, which is exciting to see. So I'm gonna leave it there. Um, we will take questions at the end of the presentation, but we'll jump right in. I'll hand it back to Adam for our application overview slide. Great, thanks, Mackie. So yeah, we wanted to, to start um, before we get into doing some myth busting, just by kind of making sure that we set the stage for kind of how colleges like ours uh, review applications. So you can see the list of kind of what the components of the application are there. Um, and, th and there are a lot of them. And I think what we really wanna focus on here is what it means when colleges like ours talk about holistic review. What does it mean to look at an application holistically? Um, and one way that I think about that is that probably the most common or one of the most common questions I get from prospective students is, you know, what's the most important part of the application? What, what do you value the most? And it, it's actually a question that's impossible to answer in a holistic review uh, approach, because the reality is that first, every part of the application we think adds value. And the ways that each part of the application adds value might differ from student to student, right? So. Um, the things that make one student stand out might be a little different than the other, the things that make another student stand out. Um, because ultimately, one of the key things about admission to colleges like ours is that different students are offered admission for different reasons. And it goes back to this notion that every single part of that application matters, but you really get to tell your story through the application. And some parts of the application may really be the strengths that, that you lead with or where your story comes out uh, most clearly. The other thing I want to say about this is that, you know, it can be hard to hear that different things matter for different students and, and knowing where you fit into that. Um, but this is where I think you have an opportunity to kind of through your research, through getting to know colleges, to, to really get to understand each college's values. Um, we've all talked a little bit about our values today. Um, and I think um, colleges more and more being able to be upfront about what their values are. And the better you understand a college's values, the better you'll be able to gauge kind of what's most important for them and, and how your story might come across through things like your essay or your volunteer work or um, your transcript or your recommendation letters. Um, so kind of hold on to this notion that there is no one most important part of an application. It's really about the, how the whole comes together and how you decide to put your story forward. So with that, I think uh, Yvonne, I believe you're up next talking about testing because we know that's also a hot topic. Yes, so at, at this point, um, a lot of folks are asking questions with regards to how testing is reviewed. And so, um, especially with the pandemic and some of the limitations that students have, even to access testing, many schools ended up going test optional. About 500 or more than 500 this year chose to go test optional and some continue to be test optional. But many families always ask, well, what does that mean? Do I submit or don't I submit my test scores? And oftentimes we also hear, well, how are you going to evaluate students when there isn't a test score? So again, going back to the slide that you saw with Adam, you saw that there were a number of different factors that we're reviewing when we're looking at an application. It's not just testing. It's not just numbers. There's a whole lot of components. So when we talk about what a test optional school is or, or you know, why be test optional, it basically is a situation in which it allows students to decide whether or not you want to submit your test scores. That is your choice. In a test optional environment, schools will consider the SAT or ACT scores if you choose to submit them. And if not, it will not count against you. Um, but again, we want to make sure that you're making the choice because again, we're going to be looking at a variety of factors, not just the testing. So if it's if it's a if you receive a score in which you're just not comfortable or you just don't want to submit your test scores, that's okay. You can choose not to do so. There are other schools that are called con considered a test flexible college. 
basically these schools allow students to submit other test scores in place of the SAT or ACT, such as one more subject exam or an IB exam or an AP exam. So these are um, just different options that students have, um, but again, it's, it's still a student's choice. Then there's also the test blind college, which does not consider the test scores, even if you submit them. So again, keeping in mind that there are these different policies, but they're really under your control is very important and important for you to understand whether or not you should submit your test score. So with that, I'll turn over to the next slide. So this is an unusual time that you are applying to college. Um, we would have hoped a year ago that we would um, not be still talking about what it means to be applying during a, pan during a pandemic. Um, and yet here we are. And, um, and so I think it's important to just acknowledge that to begin with. I mean, we're in an unusual time. The pandemic has impacted all of us and, and this whole process that you're engaging in right now in so many ways that I won't be able to count them all at this, you know, this brief period of time speaking to you today. I, the first visit I did this year, um, going to a high school, I sat down with a student who was a senior and he said to me, he, I guess he, I guess I'm a senior, he said, but it feels like I'm still a sophomore because the last time I was in this building, I was a sophomore. And, um, and it was really eye opening to, to hear something like that. And, um, and so we know the position you're in is one that is different from students in the past. And, um, and I think in acknowledging that, we need to just accept that there have been disappointments over the past year. Um, some of those have been very serious disappointments. Some of us have, have lost loved ones. Uh, some of us have, have had um, our academics seriously disrupted. Some of us had our extracurricular opportunities seriously disrupted. Um, we should recognize these, these things that have happened in the past and then think about how we can move forward in an, an unusual moment. And, um, and that moment cuts across both the college search process, but also the application process. Um, in the search process, maybe where, you, where you're beginning uh, thinking about where to apply, um, I would encourage you to go onto all of our websites. Uh, you're going to find on our websites virtual tours. You're going to find blogs. You're going to find other forms of social media. You'll find one-on-one -on -one opportunities to connect with us, um, with our students. Um, all of these are tools that we've developed over this last year in order to make this process accessible to students all around the country, all around the world, who may have in the past been able to visit campuses, but have felt that to be a more challenging thing in this moment. Uh, many of us, um, perhaps all of us, are also welcoming visitors to campus. And yet those visits may be limited in ways they weren't before. Your opportunity to stay overnight, your opportunity to observe a class. Um, and so you're going to find this is a moment where you should be taking advantage of these virtual resources, like the one you're participating in today, right now. This is not something we could have imagined two years ago we'd all be doing. Um, take advantage of those opportunities that are virtual. Take advantage of those opportunities that may be happening on campus as well. Um, and be um, open to the fact that things are going to change quickly. There may be a moment where our colleges are welcoming people to campus, then a moment where we can't. And, um, and that's okay. We understand that you're in an unusual position and as are we. And, um, and my biggest piece of advice, frankly, is to talk with us. Um, you can, should reach out to the admissions officer who works with applicants from where you live and ask questions about how our processes have changed. Um, learn about what opportunities there might be to connect with us that didn't exist a year ago or might be more of a challenge right now in this unusual moment. And that same piece of advice applies to um, how the application process itself has changed. We really want you to talk with us. Um, as you just heard, um, many colleges have changed their test practices. Um, many colleges have gone test optional that formally required tests. Um, there's a new section on the um, common application asking you about how COVID may have affected did um, your application to college. Um, these are all, um, the, there are so many opportunities, whether on the application itself or in reaching out to us directly to ask us questions, to tell your story, to make sure we understand the position you're coming from. And perhaps that some of the opportunities you wish you had had taken advantage of over the last year were unavailable to you. And if we know that information, that makes it much easier for us to understand who you are in your application. And I'll, and I'll close off just by saying um, to take care of yourselves, that this is still an unusual moment, even as things seem to be headed in the right direction. Um, there are, um, you, there's no need to take risks for your health in this admissions process. Um, that is your mental health, that's your physical health. Um, we want you to take care of yourself and, um, and 
come at this process as really an opportunity to s- discover colleges that are really exciting, that are the right fit for you, and for us to meet you in the course of that process as well. I'll hand that off to the next speaker for the next slide. All right, we're moving on to the seven myths from the seven colleges. So you're going to hear a few of our myths and how we've been able to break those myths. So the first one being admission essays, um, that they don't matter. Somewhere along the line, you might have heard that everybody just looks at kind of the numbers, those testing, those GPAs. Um, in reality, they really do matter. And in many, in many ways, this is the first opportunity students have to really come off of a page and, and to really kind of excite us. And so this is something that's going to be very important as you're considering what you write and to whom you write it to. Um, if in the case you wrote it an hour before you applied, guess what, we're gonna know that. Uh, if you didn't proofread, oh, we will definitely know that. Um, didn't address a question, yeah, we may make a note of that. Um, if you wrote, proofread, and delivered a thoughtful, meaningful um, essay, we'll love it. So really take it seriously. I can tell you my, one of my pet peeves is oftentimes when they say, I love, you know, um, Pitzer, and I'm looking forward to going to um, X institution, which is not Pitzer. That shows us that you really didn't proofread. And so you want to make sure that you're, you're, you're looking at your essays just like you would look at a resume applying for a job. So that's gonna be really, really important. In addition to that, many of us do require some type of a supplemental question. And the supplement is basically the why us type question. So um, not just take it seriously, but one of the things you've probably heard from each of us when we were talking about our institutions is that we all have certain things that are important to us, our core values. They may differ slightly from institution to institution, but it's very important that if we're asking those questions, we're asking it for a reason. Did you do your research? Did you, you know, um, you know, maybe attend a session that we presented at? Did you um, really understand why you're applying to us? Because that then answers the fit question. And we talk about fit all the time. Are you a good fit for us? Are we a good fit for you? So it's really important that you pay attention to those details because those essays absolutely matter. And they're oftentimes the favorite part of the application for many of us. I'll turn it over to the next presenter. All right, so the next um, slide is about extracurricular activities in that involvement section. Um, and the myth is the more extracurriculars that I'm involved in, the better my application will be. Um, and uh, I think you're probably all wise enough to know that that is not necessarily true. Um, there's a lot of nuance in how we are reviewing those sections um, and what we're what we're really trying to to get out of that section of the application. Um, so um, some advice first um, in terms of overall involvement, and this is mostly for younger students or for counselors um, who are working with younger students. Um, for seniors, you know, your your what you've done in high school is pretty much set. So I'll give some advice um, near the end here um, about how to present that information for us. Um, so uh, for your younger students, um, some advice, be intentional, don't give in to pressure, involve yourself in, um, you know, eight, nine, 10 different clubs and organizations um, and stretch yourself to the absolute, absolute max, especially if it's things that you're not actually incredibly interested in, but you think is going to look good on your resume. Um, you know, the point of the application in so many different ways is we want to know you and who you are. And one of those pieces is what you've done with your free time outside of school. Um, or with the time that you that you have outside of the classroom. Um, and, and so if you're doing a bunch of things that you're not actually interested in, then we're not actually getting to know the real you, the student who's gonna show up on our campuses. Um, and so it's really important to choose things that you have a genuine interest in, um, because frankly, you will uh, be better serving yourself. You'll be um, spending your time a lot more wisely and it'll be more impressive to us in the application process as well. Um, so, so as you're, you know, going about thinking about how do I spend my time outside of the classroom, um, those are some big pieces of advice. Um, the other element is, you know, joining clubs is easy, right? Anybody can sign up on the, on the dotted line and, and join a club and attend a few meetings. Um, what takes a little bit more work is organizing, coordinating, planning, um, being a leader, um, these are and, and founding clubs as well. These are these are things that um, take a little bit more work and also convey to us that this is something that you're really serious about, right? That you are passionate enough to give more of yourself and more of your time. Um, and, and frankly, you develop some more important skills along the way 
um, which are things that we are really interested in as colleges. Um, now, on the other hand, for you seniors who have, you know, you've been involved for four years, obviously last year was probably um, a little bit more difficult to do those things. Um, a little bit of advice about how to present things through the application um, to the colleges that you're applying to. Um, first, don't expect colleges to know all of the acronyms. And I would say this, this even applies a little bit more broadly. Um, explain things for us, right? Pretend that we, we don't know. So clearly, all right, if you're in soccer, we probably know what soccer is, okay? Um, but if you're in uh, FLBA or um, you know, 4-H or something along those lines, um, don't expect that we know exactly what that is. Um, explain it to us a little bit and explain what you do and and how you're involved and why you're involved. I know it's a limited section there, um, but the more you can give us to chew on and kind of understand what that experience was like for you, the better off your application will be. Um, and then, you know, use those additional sections of, of your application um, to kind of supplement what might exist just in that involvement section. Um, so resumes can be a phenomenal way to do this. A lot of students will submit resumes. Um, portfolios, um, if, if something, the things that you're working on have the opportunity to um, you know, provide the, the portfolios, links to um, performances, to art, et cetera. Um, a lot of us will actually accept artistic supplements as well as part of your application. Um, those are great ways um, to, to highlight some things in the application. I will say, don't go extremely overboard with it, right? You wanna make sure that um, your application as a whole is concise and that the important things are getting across to us. So um, your you know, 120 page novel that you wrote, we probably don't need to read the entire thing. Um, a synopsis will probably do. Um, so my overall advice in terms of thinking about your extracurricular activities is again, authenticity and, and genuinely getting involved in these things is key. Um, because if you think of this as just resume building as just activities that you're doing to get into college, um, first of all, it's probably not going to help you get into college very much. Um, and secondly, it's not going to be an enjoyable experience for you, right? And, and frankly, your high school experience should be about exploring and, and doing things that you were really interested in and passionate about. Um, so I definitely encourage you to, to approach it that way. Um, and you'll have a better time and frankly, we'll have a better time reading your application as well. So um, I will pass it on to my next colleague. Awesome, and that is me. Um, and yeah, the next uh, the next myth is essentially that if you have a, a strong application, you've got good grades. Um, you know, you'll have a a really good chance of being admitted. That 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 you'll have a kind of guarantee of getting in. And and I mean, I don't know how to tell you y'all this, but um, there's just no guarantees in life, people. So um, uh, you should never assume anything about what your chances are going to be at any particular school. And I think part of where this comes from is just a lot of information that's out there that, that can be misleading. Um, it's, it's really easy to kind of look up kind of historical um, data on what the academics for a student who's been admitted to a certain type of college uh, has been. It's easy to look on a college's website and see an average GPA or average test scores, kind of look where you, where your numbers are and say, well, I'm, I'm above average by their standards. So therefore I'm, I have a good chance of being admitted. Um, but kind of going back to what I said earlier, you know, different students are admitted for different reasons, and it's really dangerous to make assumptions about where you're going to get in for sure, because it can cause you to end up limiting your options. And so much of what you should be doing in your college search is actually kind of expanding the, the range of options that you're considering. So um, what I would say is because college admissions can be unpredictable, in the face of that unpredictability, focus on what you can control. Um, do your research to figure out why you'd be a good fit for the colleges you're applying to, and, and really try not to fixate too much on any one particular college. It's okay to have several top choices, especially early on in the process. Uh, it makes it easier for you to end up with multiple options that you're excited about so that once you make that choice for whichever school ends up being the best option for you, it can become your dream college. Um, so that's my, my real advice here is um, focus less on trying to project what your likelihood of admission is at colleges. Instead, really think about what you value, what colleges are a good fit, and then allow the process to play out. Um, so with that, let's move it on to, I believe, Mackie. Yeah, uh, that's right. So um, we're gonna move on to talk about um, average grades in hard classes are better than A's in easy ones. Um, not so fast, exactly right. The things that I want you to take away from this particular slide um, are that um, time management, self-awareness, and playing to your strengths 
are all skills that you need in college. Um, and so you certainly develop those further through um, a, a college program, but if you can do yourself sort of a service and get some of those skills under your belt while you're preparing your own sort of high school program and managing your time um, and playing to your strengths, um, we're gonna see that, um, that actually that program that is a really good fit for you in and of itself shows that you're prepared to take on the rigors of a college program um, because you're not overdoing it. You're not um, laying on sort of like the really, really tricky classes that um, you find more challenging. Um, it's important to challenge yourself. So um, there is sort of a, a line to walk here, um, but it's really critical that you take the time to think through where you wanna challenge yourself, where that's gonna be really enjoyable for you to push yourself um, and, and where things are not gonna become chores or huge huge amounts of, you know, sort of pile on huge amounts of stress. Um, I think what Ben said earlier about being kind to yourself is also critical here. Um, you really need to allow yourself to get as much enjoyment out of your high school or secondary school program as you can, particularly in this um, environment, which is um, which is sort of ongoing um, and challenging. Um, and so if you are finding things that aren't necessarily as interesting to you and you're really pushing yourself to take those harder classes in those areas, it might not serve you well. Um, and then finally, I just want to tease out the fact that we do do a lot of research on your educational environment. We draw pieces of your application together to try to paint a picture of what has been offered to you and what tools and resources you have access to. And of course, those that you don't have access to. So we're not directly comparing one applicant to another when their backgrounds are completely different. Um, so I think that's certainly another important takeaway from this particular slide. I'm going to hand it over to Tony next um, to talk about liberal arts programs and careers. Thanks, Maggie. See, then we'll get the next slide up here. So um, some of you may wonder um, why a liberal arts college and maybe ask, does our model of education really prepare you for jobs, careers, and life after college? Uh, for those of us who work in the liberal arts college realm, you know, we know that uh, the public press is not always so friend to, friendly to us in this regard, but the resounding answer is yes. Uh, the skills that employers seek are exactly the kinds of skills we develop at our colleges. And I hope you've got a sense to see that in hearing about the, the rigorous academic programs that we offer, the breadth of study, the innovative way that we, all of us collectively, have found ways to get our students engaged in experiential learning experiences that take students outside the classroom, combine that with what they learn, force them to work together, to problem solve. Those are the skills here that you can list it, critical thinking skills, commu communicating effectively in written and oral form, creative problem solving, exposure to lots of different kinds of ideas and breadth of study that creates a well-roundedness and collaboration and working well with, with teams and with others. It's counterintuitive in some ways, but in an ever-changing fast-paced world, it's the flexible thinkers uh, that succeed. So our colleges offer internship, co-op opportunities, and we all have career development opportunities and staffs that helps our students. And you'll find that LaBarge College graduates actually punch above our, our weight when you look at grad school and job success uh, data and information, including in the STEM fields uh, as well. So uh, yes, LaBarge College can prepare you uh, for, for life uh, after college. I think I'll turn it back to, um, uh, to Milian here for the next slide. I think you're muted. I said some really great stuff too. Uh, <laughs> I have no doubt. <laughs> so um, this is something that you know we we run into quite often, just working in higher education, uh, that only uh, a certain group of colleges can lead you to success. Uh, it might surprise you to know there's actually four thousand colleges in the nation. Um, uh, there are probably about a hundred small private liberal arts colleges like us. And so just when you begin with that categorization and that list, you realize that you have several great options that will lead you to careers and lives of fullness. Um, so uh, Reed is a college that, you know, has for a long time has not participated in the ranking. So I will acknowledge my bias. Uh, but one of the things I point out is uh, there have been folks who have been part of the rankings have decided to walk away. Uh, they dropped off the top 100 list 
And then the very next year, two years later, when they submitted that form again, suddenly they jumped up 50 spots. And I have a hard time believing that a college is 50 positions better simply because they did their homework and sent in the form. Um, so what that tells me is that what's considered in the rankings might not be what, the, what actually the school is about. Um, if you take a look at the list that makes up what colleges are considering, all of it might not be bad stuff, but you might consider the proportion of those items in a very different way. Maybe they think grades is worth 20% of their rankings. Maybe you think that grades are actually only worth about, worth about 40% of whether or not a school is a great place. That's really up to you. And so what we would suggest is that you make your own list for what's important to you, where your values are, what makes a good fit. Um, a few things you might consider is if a school will get you in and out in four years. When we think about college, that's certainly a standard expectation is college is four years. Is this gonna be a place that helps you do that? Um, is financial available uh, available for you and how is it available? And will it meet your family's needs? Um, colleges have net, net price calculators that help you get a really good estimate for what the cost will be. But value, which is something that you decide in April, um, in March and April, when you're sitting down at the table, having learned about colleges and you're determining whether or not it's worth the price, that's what um, folks would um, really, um, that, that's what we think is actually really important in the process. Are the students there happy? Are you going to be fulfilled? Are these communities um, that um, will actually engage you while you're a student there? And at the end of the day, you want to know what life beyond that college looks like. So one tip I give folks is don't just think about your first year. Think about who you are your senior year at different colleges. And that version of you that you're most excited about at that particular college might be the place you want to be. And I promise you, you're never going to look at the numbers at the end of the day when you find a place that fulfills all of your needs. And I'm going to pass this on to um, the next presenter. And that is uh, Tony. Thanks, Melia. So um, this last one um, is regarding financial aid. And we know the cost and affordability is a concern for students and parents. Uh, we also know it's a very intimidating topic to engage in or a very difficult one for many students and parents. Um, I know that sometimes we don't help ourselves on the college side because each of us has some unique approaches to how we might do some, some merit scholarships and, and need-based aid and a few of those kinds of policies. And we can talk about that in the Q&A section. But there are a couple of things though that I would love to share with you and have you take away. One, know that um, many of the colleges here uh, offer generous need-based aid and, and merit, and some offer merit-based scholarship programs that make our colleges accessible to students. Uh, many of us offer need-based scholarships for international students as well. Um, also know that in many cases, um, you'll find that student let debt load at, our, at the many private colleges here are well below national averages because we've made the commitment to invest in our students and invest in scholarship and grants. Um, know also that we understand that there's been a lot of disruption over the last couple of years. And so that's something that our teams are aware of and our financial aid teams can work with a lot of families to understand your specific situation. So don't be afraid to contact uh, admissions and financial aid uh, staffs. We're happy to walk you through the process and explain what the forms are, how to complete the forms and what might be necessary and all the things you need to do. We're, um, don't be afraid um, to reach out to us. Just key tip here is to make sure to complete all the forms on time. That's gonna be really important. But know that we're here to help. And at the end of the day, um, I think you'll find that given the kind of experiences that, that we've offered, that we've talked about today, um, our students who have that transformative experience find that find the value in the kind of education that we offer and decide that it is worth it for them. It's gonna be an individual situation for you and your family, but uh, this is a, uh, the group of colleges here, uh, we've had success in graduating students and finding those students successful in lives and careers after our colleges. So thank you very much. I think at this point, we'll um, believe open it up to some Q&A. Milian, I think uh, uh, we'll be uh, back to you. Or is it Mackie? Excellent. Thanks a lot, Tony. Um, so over um, the course of this session, you've all asked really great questions, and we've been responding to many of those, those that we thought we could answer generally, um, or um, the institutional representative may have, may have answered a question that was uh, specific for their college. Um, and I'm going just to go around and ask the panelists a few of the questions that, you, that you've asked. Uh, feel free to jump in. I'm going to combine some because some of those are, are fairly similar. 
Uh, but to start off with, um, you know, uh, Mackie, why don't you, why don't you why don't you take a swing at this? Uh, we have a really great question. Someone is curious about uh, this definition of the mold. We we call ourselves seven colleges that break the mold. Um, what is the mold referring to? Um, what is the the um, a definition by which we are um, defining ourselves that's so uh, unique and distinctive? Yeah, it is a great question. Kudos to uh, the person who asked it. Um, it sort of reminds me of a, a barred orientation question, which is what needs to be the case for things to be otherwise. We sort of have to define something in order to talk about how something else is different. Um, so it's a great it's a great point. Um, and I think what we're pointing to, and I feel free to chime in um, any, any other panelists, of course, um, I think what we're pointing to is that institutions, we represent institutions that have moved away from some of the, the sort of regular routine of higher education and meaning that we focus on things like innovation and risk-taking, um, not playing it safe, not doing the same thing and repeating ourselves over and over again, um, but rolling the dice on a new program because it's the right thing to do. It's serving um, a group of students who maybe has been underserved in the past, um, embracing change um, and not embracing things that are the same or feel safe, um, but actually really going for it and leading students by example because we as institutions are making internal and um, outward facing changes that I think um, speak to our own interest in self-improvement um, and developing more self-awareness and growing in that space. Um, getting feedback from students and truly valuing student feedback and ideas um, and actually having that in many ways change the course of um, whether it's a, a syllabus or, um, or again, it's the development of, of a new project or something like that. Um, so um, I think we, we change, we change quickly, we pivot when we need to. Um, and I think that that is what we're, we're speaking to um, a little bit when we, say, when we say that we sort of broke the mold. We broke away from um, what, what could be sort of a more stereotypical sort of routine of here are the classes, here are the programs, that's what we offer. Uh, making change and adapting um, is critical, I think, to all of our missions. But if any other folks have thoughts, please do chime in. I'll, I'll add something uh, just because I think Mackie did a great job in answering that particular question. But I always find I had a, a faculty or a dean of faculty used to always say, because again, we, we get this question quite a bit, being a member of the Claremont Colleges and having to compare ourselves to the other, the other consortium members. But he used to always say, Pitzer is a petri dish for the Claremont Colleges. It wasn't always a comment that I loved, but I understood where it was coming from. Because again, we were the school that um, did things slightly different. And I think with my colleagues here, just like Mackie said, is that we're looking at what has been done in the past and we're willing to make the change because we see education from a different lens. And our students are also excited to be part of, of that change and to be part of an education that allows them to be a little bit more creative, a little bit more adventurous. Um, we also tend to admit to our core values because we're looking for students that are excited about the things that we're excited about. It's part of the reason why we talk so much about the fit piece. So I think when you're looking at institutions and where you might like to go to school, are you interested in going to a place that will allow you to be part, to, 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 um, be part of the creation of your education? Do you want to take risks? Do you want to be in a place that, that might do things a little bit different? Um, and these are some of the schools I think that would allow you to have that flexibility and be adventurous with your education. I'd add just, this is a really cool program for you to, to be participating in right now. Um, because you, know, you may have done other kinds of programs where you've heard panels of colleges speaking. And sometimes I've had people complain to me about panels that they've witnessed where um, some of the colleges sound kind of the same. And, um, and this is a group of seven colleges where absolutely none of us sound the same. We don't sound the same as each other. We don't sound the same as pretty much any other college out there. And I think that's one of the things that really breaks the mold about this group is that we are really unique institutions that represent the real breadth of American higher education. And when you're there 
and your counselors are talking about fit or we're talking about fit, this is a real chance for you to find that fit, to, to identify those places that are genuinely unique and not necessarily for every student, but might be the right fit for you and, and who you are. And I think that's you know, an exciting opportunity in a group like this. Well said, I like that a lot. Um, I, this is this is a question um, that um, maybe we can have uh, Dennis and at least start off with it. Uh, it's more of a, of a general question, but um, it deals with sort of the progression, you know, changes in the transcript. And specifically, this person wants to know how would we compare a transcript that has the equal amount of rigor for all four years versus someone who added rigor as 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 um, as they became a senior. And I will add a little bit of that, um, and maybe we can also talk about um, maybe someone that didn't have a great start um, and maybe became stronger at the end. So, um, Drew, can we talk? Do you feel comfortable starting off yeah. with that one? Absolutely, absolutely. Great. Yeah, thanks, Million. Um, and this is a great question because, frankly, it allows us to talk about a topic that's really important in this application process, which is, um, you know, that that academic record, right? Um, when we review an application, we are looking at a lot more than just your GPA. Um, I know students get very stressed out sometimes about their GPA, and um, I actually had an email this morning that said the GPA in my transcript isn't calculated correctly, and I said, well, don't worry, um, because we don't actually really care about that GPA. Um, what we care about is your complete transcript, and what that means is we're looking at a variety of factors. Um, we are looking at the course rigor, right? So we're looking at the difficulty of the courses that a student has selected across four years. Um, keeping in mind the context from which a student is selecting those courses. So not all students have the opportunity to take the same um, level of rigor within their high school curriculum. So that's a really important factor for us. Um, we are looking at performance um, and that isn't just a raw GPA, um, that includes things like trends, right? So some students um, start out really strong and may taper off as the rigor increases. Some students go the opposite direction and really gain steam throughout high school. Um, some students go up and down or just stay up the whole time. Um, so there's a, a variety of ways to look at trends throughout the transcript. Um, we also look at areas of potential strength or weakness in the application. Some students have incredibly strong grades in um, humanities areas like English and, and history. Um, and some students have stronger grades in the math and science areas. Um, so again, we're really digging apart that transcript and paying really close attention to a lot of factors in there. Um, now it's tough to say there's not one factor that is automatically qualifying or disqualifying. And that's, that's true of the academic record. It's true of every single part of your application, right? So it's really tough for us to say, oh, if we see this, it's a yes. If we see this, it's a no, um, et cetera. Generally speaking, um, your academic record is the best indicator that we have of your potential in the classroom here, right? Because it represents your work across a period of time, um, those three or four years of high school. And so um, that's why we're paying such close attention to it. And, and the most competitive students clearly are going to be ones who have um, challenged themselves to that high level of rigor throughout four years and had high performance in all those courses. Um, now, that being said, there are, and I will tell you, there are, this happens all the time, there are dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of instances of students who have a less than perfect academic record, who still show a lot of promise and a lot of achievement and have a lot of attributes that we are looking for um, at Denison, and I'm sure my colleagues would agree, um, that we are able to admit every year. Um, and so again, I will repeat that it's, there's nothing automatically qualifying or disqualifying in that academic record. Um, but certainly, um, you know, things to pay attention to are the rigor of the courses you select over those four years um, and the performance in those courses throughout those four years as well. Hope that answers the question. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, Yvonne, I have a question for you. Can you talk about um, how, how <clears throat> one may experience disruptions in their extracurricular activities, how one might deal with that? Sure, and, and that may differ by, by extracurricular activities. I've actually seen some really creative ways in which students have been able to still engage in some of their extracurricular activities, even in things that I didn't think were possible. Um, I've seen students that have been part of orchestra that have been able, and, and singing, that have been able to do that virtually, which has been very, very surprising. I've, I've seen students that have been in athletics and have continued to do all of their practices, um, again, through Zoom. Um, I've seen club, you know, students that have been part of clubs or led clubs continue to find ways to be active and involved. Um, maybe if they couldn't do it on campus, maybe they found causes in which they were able to help donate 
funds towards. Um, so in many ways, students have just utilized this, have been, you know, responded differently from this pandemic and have been able to be creative in maintaining some of their extracurricular activities. Um, there have been some cases in which that wasn't the case. And so it's always really important for you to tell us that. Um, when you have, when you're doing your application, there is a section on, is there anything else you'd like to tell us? It's a wonderful place for you to share this information. You can also share it in the COVID question, but a lot of times those tend to be reserved for, for other more, more um, larger issues. But if you want to mention the fact that you were, you know, president of your club, you were able to continue to maintain the club, those are great things to, to share because leadership still is leadership, even if it's, you know, virtual um, and not in person. So opportunities for students to be able to highlight um, what they've done, even throughout the disruptions, is exactly what we want to know in your applications. Excellent. Thanks so much, Yvonne. Uh, Adam, we've got some really good questions. Um, folks are curious if schools like us, if we accept transfer students, if we um, admit non-traditional students. And in addition to that, is this a population for which we set aside space? And what type of requirements might we have for a transfer a non-traditional student that we might not have for our, our incoming first year, first time first year students? Yeah, I'll be happy to, to take a stab at that, Milian. And I know some of my colleagues in the room have really great programs, especially for non-traditional students that they may want to share as well. Um, but I think the short answer is, yeah, we, I think, all welcome students from a variety of backgrounds. And, and transfer students are, are one of the, the many um, kind of avenues to, to bringing uh, students that represent, um, you know, the broader population of folks going to college um, bring really valuable experience to us. Um, same thing for non-traditional students. Um, I know at Whitman, um, we welcome a handful of non-traditional students every year and have a special scholarship program uh, for non-traditional students as well. Um, so I think, you know, the question of like, do we save spots or reserve spots? I think everybody has a different way of thinking about um, the transfers versus incoming first year students and, and how many spots might be reserved. Um, but I know that at Whitman, and I think at most colleges, uh, when we're thinking about who's going to be coming in our incoming class, we do think about a certain number of first year students that we're targeting and a certain number of transfer students as well. But I would love if any of the my colleagues have specific programs for transfers or non-traditional students to be able to share that as well. We have a couple of programs. I'll just jump in, and um, we have some. We have a return to college program for much older students um, who are older than 24, 25 years old. Um, so definitely something to be thinking about if if you know of or maybe are an older student. Um, some colleges do have program programs that are sort of like this return to college program, um, and there might be different ways to apply as well. So thinking about a non traditional secondary school background, if you're looking for a way to apply that's maybe not through the Common App, which is definitely created for a more traditional secondary or high school student. Um, there might be other ways to apply. BARD offers an essay exam, for example. So it's definitely worth diving in to see um, maybe what some of the other options are for non-traditional applicants um, that might play to your strengths more, again, sort of talking about um, self-awareness and, and playing to your strengths. Mackie, thanks, thanks for that intro. I was going to jump in and say that, you know, for students, one other way to look at the, that is to also say, what if I don't fit the mold of the common application? And at Bennington, we have a dimensional application, which is given Bennington, you design your application. You figure out what it is you think you want to present to us. Obviously going to be a lot of writing, show us some rigor, give us a sense for who you are, but it can take any number of forms. And so there are also non-traditional ways to demonstrate who you are in the application process. Excellent. Quick hit. I'm going to ask folks just to chat out to everyone um, how many applications uh, you'll get in a, in a typical year. Uh, keep in mind our colleges are different sizes. And so, you know, these numbers out of context <laughs> may not mean a whole lot. Um, and so, um, and the same for incoming classes um, really vary. So um, just keep that in mind when you see some of the responses, but I'll just have people chat that really quickly. I'll um, move on to answer one of our next questions. And uh, this is a question more about uh, the essay. And the question is really about the COVID section of the essay. And um, one of the great parts about um, the common application, uh, they understood that during a pandemic that it's taken up so much of our lives and our experiences 
that unless we had an area to really express all that is COVID-19, that's all we admission counselors would be writing about. And as much as um, this has been a big part of our life, we think that there is also an opportunity to express something about yourself that has nothing to do with this particular pandemic. And so I think it's sort of a brilliant move on the part of common application to sort of create this escape valve and allows you to talk about who you are authentically and what your fit is for that college. And so um, what I tell people is your essay is your conversation with the admission committee. What do you want to sit down and talk to us about? And when you think about your application, the recommendation is a teacher telling you who you are in the classroom, your transcripts or your grades. Um, it's rare that we get to sit down with you and you tell us about the things you like, um, what you're looking for and what you're excited about. And when you think about that, the essay takes on an entirely different composition. Um, so there's another question about, you know, how do I deal with sort of the Y X essay? Why do I want to go to this particular college without having it be, be overwrought? And one of the um, things that I've noticed is um, essays um, sometimes seem like a great opportunity to talk about really painful experiences in your life. And um, if, if this and, and what it does for admission college is that it may gives the, give them a disproportionate idea of how much that makes up you as an individual or your experience. And so, you know, is, is that a time where you talk about something that you haven't shared with anyone except some of your best friends? Um, it might be a part of your life, but I would also say that there are other parts of you that um, that you don't have to leave up to scrutiny and not understand how a college may take in that information. So speak within yourself. Don't use language you don't normally use. And your goal is to tell us who you are and help us match up what parts of your life and interests match up with features of our community. So I hope that's helpful. I'm, I'll open it up and see if folks have anything else to add. All right, so I'm going to ask a question uh, to all the panelists. We know that um, you know in recent years, this idea of taking a gap year, uh, which is getting admitted to a school and saying, hey, I'm actually gonna do something for a year. And then uh, re-enrolling in that school is something students think a lot about. Um, what we're going to do is just do a really quick lightning round and we're all going to tell you what our defer policy is because it does tend to vary from school to school. And so um, um, why don't we go Drew, Tony, Adam, Mackie, Yvonne, because that's who I can see on my screen and then we'll figure out the rest. <laughs> Drew? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so defer policy, um, we ask students to um, who are admitted to Denison to request a deferral. Um, by June 1st, um, and students can request a deferral for a semester or a full year. Um, and so students, we do have some students who enter in the spring semester, um, who start in January. We have a, usually a cohort of about 30 or 40 students entering each January. Um, and then we have a larger group of students entering obviously in the fall um, after doing a full gap year. Um, so most of those deferrals are approved um, for a, a variety of reasons, but we definitely wanna hear about what you're, what you're doing during that interregnum, um, so yeah. Thanks, Drew. <clears throat> At Bennington, we love students uh, who, who take a, a gap year if that uh, or gap semester if they feel that they need to. So we do ask that you let, let us know and uh, we'll review those, but pretty much grant in cases where you're taking some time off, volunteer work, uh, doing um, an internship or whatever. So that's great. It, typically for us, it's not unusual to have up to 10% uh, of our in, uh, intern class every year of students who've taken a gap year. We also have an opportunity to, through an independent gap year learning program for you to earn credit for your gap year learning experience, depending on what it is. Uh, you give a presentation and you put, you put uh, a portfolio and a presentation together. So that's kind of something cool that we do specific to Bennington. Yeah, Whitman also very pro gap year. Um, we don't have a firm deadline for um, asking students to request, but do typically um, encourage that before August for planning purposes. Uh, in my nine years, we have not yet turned down a gap year request. Our pro gap year, if you wanna take one, that's absolutely something that um, you should embrace. Um, it's part of our responses. So if you're admitted and you're responding to your offer of admission, um, it's actually one of the options um, that may be the case for, for many of us. Um, you can say, I accept my offer, but I'm deferring for a year. Um, we only allow a full year deferral, um, which is maybe the only difference. Um, the first year arc of our um, academic curriculum is very specific. Um, and so we really do ask that students defer for a full year and not just a semester. Mm -hmm. 
can't I can't remember if I'm next, but um, I'm gonna <laughs> jump in <laughs> for, for Pitzer. Um, the deadline to defer is May 10th. Um, so if you're admitted, you do need to notify us by May 10th. It, there's a request for a deferral. Um, again, it, it just depends on what the class is looking like in terms of whether we will grant it or not, but generally we do. Um, so every year is a little different, but generally we have about 10 to, 10 to about 15 students every year that choose to take a deferral. And generally it is for the full year. Um, it just works better given how our classes work um, to defer for the entire year. At St. John's, we um, we allow students to defer um, for up to a year, and they need to let us know by June 1st. Occasionally, we let students defer beyond that year, but that's on a case-by-case -case basis. And, um, and the vast majority of students who'd like to do a gap year are welcome to do it. The only thing we ask is that you, you don't go to another college and take classes there, but the experience is that you might not be able to have a college. Great. Um, at Reed College, uh, you do have to apply for a defer program, usually within a couple of weeks after the May 1st deadline. Um, in a given year, um, we may approve about half of the deferrals up to all of the deferrals. Um, so it really depends on the size of our incoming class. Uh, so there is occasionally some limitations to if you're able to do that, uh, but that certainly varies depending on what it looks like. Um, we are coming up on time, so I'm going to ask uh, one more question of all of our panelists. Uh, that um, maybe we can all sort of uh, think about and, and throw out. Um, this was a great question, and I'm, I'm just going to paraphrase because I can't find it right now. But someone is just really interested if we have any more sort of really distinctive or creative tips <laughs> for the application process. And I know we all probably have this one thing that we think makes makes a huge impact. But if we're to leave uh, our folks with some you know fruit of wisdom about one thing they can do that we think makes the difference, what would that be? I can give one small piece of advice, um, which is, you know, I, I always find, often find that students will underrate an aspect of their experience that they don't think will be interesting to colleges that I usually find really, really fascinating. Um, you know, the ultimate example of this is a student who I was interviewing and uh, he told me, and this was not in his application at all, that he was a uh, world ranked Pokemon trading card player. And I was like, <laughs> That is something that needs to be in your application. I will never read that in another person's application. Um, and so, you know, don't underrate those things. We are interested in, in, in the complete person. Um, and so those, those little elements can be really fascinating to us. You don't have to be a world ranked Pokemon trading card player, but, um, but you've probably got something that's different about you that I would, I would definitely love to read about. I'll jump in with an, another one. Um, uh, I think, um, sometimes coping with writer's block or just not knowing where to start with your essay or supplemental pieces. Um, I'm a big fan of free writing. We do a lot of it at Bard. <laughs> um, I'm sure we do it at other institutions that are represented this evening, but um, you don't have to have something in your mind to start writing. If you're really struggling to think about how you want to structure an essay or what you want to say, just start writing something down. Just start writing. Um, I would say that that can um, really get you to where you want to go with your essay. Um, you don't have to have it planned in your mind to get it on paper. Just start writing the first thought that comes to mind. I'd throw out there, don't, don't under, uh, underestimate the value of the, the, maybe the supplemental essays that many colleges will ask you to write. Um, it's often we focus so much on the common application personal essay and we forget other aspects of the application. But the reality is when we read an application, we're reading it all the way through. And sometimes there's an amazing moment that comes through the common application essay. But sometimes that amazing moment is in a supplemental essay or it's in a recommendation or it comes from an interview. And, um, and we look at this application as a whole. And so, um, and so each of these moments in an application are an opportunity for you to share something about yourself that's significant. And, um, and you should take advantage of all those opportunities. And, and I note the supplemental essay in particular because at St. John's, that's something that I care a lot about. I wanna know why you see yourself as a fit for what we do. And so I rely on that essay to really find that right fit. And I'm sure that's true of many of my colleagues here too. Yeah, I'll have to agree with Ben. The supplemental essay for me is my favorite piece in the application, simply because it's so directly related to our core values. And we wanna know that you're excited about the things that we're excited about. That's where the fit piece comes in. So when you're talking about, you know, how 
you might be able to contribute to our, our school or what you've done at, at your high school. Those are things that, are, that really are of interest to us. And so the more you can be genuine and share, communicate that excitement, that's what we really want to know from your application. I would just add that authenticity kills uh, in what we do. That's what gets us excited. Uh, and so a lot of students sometimes feel like I have to put on somebody that I think that they want me uh, to be. And what we're really interested is, is kind of the person, the veneer behind what you might not always show to a lot of people. But if, if you can give us a glimpse into you, who you are, and your application is a page in the life. You can't tell us everything, but hopefully there are a few pages you can show us that uh, will give us a sense for who you are. And each of you has a unique story to tell. Don't be afraid to tell that story. Find that voice and let that voice come through. I'll just jump in and add, I think context matters so much. So if there's something in your background or your journey through high school, that's really important to understanding kind of your grade trend or um, why you've spent your time doing the things that you've spent your time doing, or if there's been things that have gotten in the way of you being involved in some of the things that you would have spent your time on, um, helping us understand what that is, whether it's family considerations, financial considerations, um, mental health, um, those types of things can really help us uh, fully appreciate your journey and um, kind of what you would bring to our institutions. One of the pieces of advice I, I try to help people with is how to um, get that recommendation letter that you get into the top 10% of recommendation letters that we read. I think there, there's a broad middle, but um, they're just, there's again, no one else in your application who tells us what you're like talking to other students, how you're building community in the classroom, how you speak out, how you went extra hard in that project. I personally think if folks have the option of doing an academic rec and uh, a non-academic rec, I, I love an academic rec as, as that place where you're talking about this experience. Of course, I'm biased. Um, but one of the things I encourage people to do is to have a really clear conversation um, with that person. You might say something like, you know, Mr. Hansen, this is a college that's really important to me. This is a place I've been thinking about for a long time. And what you share about how I am in the classroom is incredibly important. You know me like no one else does. You can share things with them that no one else can say. Can you write me the best recommendation to help me get into my college options? And I think if you make a really clear, sincere ask that that teacher is more likely to dig deep. And if they say no, then it's okay. That's a gift. That's someone who was not able to write you something that was going to be as competitive as possible and find someone else who's really excited to write that letter for you. So as much as you can, um, try to leverage that to, to really tell a story that only they can. So we are at our last two minutes. I think we've covered a lot of ground. Um, and what I'll say, and I think this is safe to say for all my colleagues, we would love to talk to you more. And you will hear from all of us, um, but we certainly expect that this won't be the last time that you'll communicate with us. And so we all have really wonderful programming that's offered for you. Uh, we do it in really creative ways. Um, our goal is to get to know you personally to figure out how great of a fit you are for college. And if you're no nervous about applying, we just wanna encourage you to take that step. And the best expression of you saying that you wanna be a, a part of that community is submitting that application. Um, if you have any questions, reach out to us. Um, and we will also reach out to you. And once this video is ready, um, we're going to make sure that you can contact any of us and request it so you can watch it again, view it again as much as you'd like. And so along with my colleagues, I want to thank you all for joining us tonight. It was so very good to talk to you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Good to see you all.